Hey, what is going on, everybody out there? This is Jake James Lugo, scene editor here at thecoalition.com, and welcome to a brand new episode of TK Spotlight, where I bring on phenomenal individuals from throughout the gaming industry and the various corners of the internet, talk about the good that they've done, a lot of the cool stuff they've been a part of, and a whole bunch of other great things that you guys are going to enjoy. Hopefully, you've been enjoying the episodes we've been posting up. Today, I got a very special guest from the realm of YouTube. Got a YouTube commentator, content creator. He does a lot of videos almost daily at this point. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Jarbo, a.k.a. Monday Matt. Matt, what's good? How's it going? It's going good, man. Thanks for having me on. Of course, man. And now this is going to be fun because, again, I get to talk with you a little bit about, you know, an aspect of YouTube that I don't really dive too much into, or at least I get to talk about as much with other people. So, I mean, you do a lot of videos, not just on gaming, on on your Monday Matt channel, but you also do a lot of videos, you know, related to entertainment, to movies, etc. on Three Buck Theater, and then you appear on a variety of podcasts and stuff. Has it gotten easier for you over time uh, since you've been really kind of, you know, talking about different stuff online that uh, on your Monday Matt channel? Uh, well, I, I believe everything gets easier as time goes on. I think uh, on the Monday Matt channel, I've put out, uh, I want to say, close to 4,500 videos in the past uh, six years. I just cracked the six-year mark of starting the channel. Congrats. And uh, thank you. I'm like, where's the time gone? Oh, my <laughs> God. Uh, and then on Three Buck Theater, I think I'm I'm around like 400 or whatnot because a lot of it's just news. So it's like just what's happening and and putting out the information. Um, so you, you get into a rhythm, right? You find a rhythm, you find your voice. Um, it's not that it's, it, it, I've always been a talker, which has been really good for me. Uh, the hardest part is like trying to find the things to talk about. Yeah. Because the way YouTube is now is like, uh, you can, you can make some, I should say, okay. So the way YouTube wants you to operate is like, let's say, uh, you're like with this show, if you were to run this show on YouTube, you're, you know, talking about gaming. So you're going to mostly be in that niche. Whereas uh, I talk about a wide variety of topics on the main channel. And so while uh, I call it a scattershot approach and that works in some cases, but YouTube ultimately doesn't like that because I'm bringing in so many people from so many areas that they can't really target them directly. The algorithm has trouble recommending certain videos of a certain type. You make their job harder, basically. <laughs> I do make their job harder. And then ultimately that makes my job harder. Um, and so then over on three buck theater, because it's, it's, it's predominantly entertainment and movie, like yeah, I'd say with the high emphasis on star Wars and comic book movies, cause let's, let's face it. That's pretty much what, what a lot of people care about right yeah, now. Right? <laughs> and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not complaining in the slightest, but, uh, but that that's doing better on its own because that's a very, uh, targeted type of content. And the way that YouTube wants you to do is focus on that. And, and that makes their job easier. So uh, that that's that's part of what I do is just experiment with certain things to see what works, what doesn't. And it's you know I've been doing this as a as a career now for three years full time next month. That's really cool. Congrats on that. Now you brought up something interesting because obviously changes in YouTube. That's been a very big thing ever since last year. I want to say, and even uh, maybe yeah. before that. I mean, you and a lot of other commentation uh, commentary channels and other even gaming channels. A lot, pretty much everybody at this point has been affected by it in one way or another. Some bigger, some smaller, some more so than others. But for you, I mean, with all the changes that have been happening with YouTube, do you see things getting a little bit better for the creator? You know, not just gaming, not just commentary commentation not just podcasts or whatever but just the creator everybody as a whole that that individual that makes content for the platform do you think things are going to get better over time because it feels like everybody's uh, always sounding the doomsday clock well everyone sounds a doomsday clock and i'll be i'll be honest i'll be bluntly honest uh it sells that's the whole reason for it um people like to constantly sit there and say youtube shutting my channel down like the boy YouTube that cried wolf basically it's the, I don't want to call it crying wolf. I don't believe that's a hundred percent accurate. Mm. It, it isn't that it does kind of come across as being in that realm, so to speak. But the reason why they do that is because it creates fear within their audience. That's something that their audience likes is then, then going to go away. And at the same time, and and people give me crap because they think I'm too blunt about this, but I'll be truthful. Uh, you know, the, the the content creator is scared. Yeah. And and the thing is, is is what you have to realize is that we constantly and I mean constantly have to defend our right to exist. And you may not think that you may think in 2018 with, you know, you're hearing story after story of these YouTubers making a big you got millionaire YouTubers every single year. Uh, all this people making money. It's, it's not as much money as you think. It's, it's enough money to live in some cases, I think, in, in many cases. But at the same time, we're going up against establishment media. We're going up against uh, establishment press. Like I know you do some work for IGN, yeah. And and, and so like let's let's say for example Polygon, 
Polygon is a website that pulls in approximately 40 million views a month, right? From based upon the last metric I looked at. That's a lot of likes million. on YouTube, basically. It's, it's a, well, they, they get, yeah, they get a lot of hits per month. And the thing is, though, is that, that their type of content that they put out uh, is not necessarily, like, I think the best for gaming. I, I, they, they're more opinion based, I think, than, than gaming news oriented, but they have an audience for it. However, just recently, they ran an article uh, trying to attack conservative YouTubers who are upset at the way YouTube has been uh, been treating them because it is confirmed that there were people that were uh, flagging down conservative channels because they were new hires. And YouTube, in the wake of the apocalypse, is trying to combat the, the you know the issues that they've been facing. And and believe me, that there they've are been many, a lot of heat overall. Like a, a lot, lot of heat. stuff. And the thing is, what people have to realize too is, and they go after YouTube for this. And I've been critical of YouTube, but I I also understand. YouTube is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like they didn't create the problem, but they did allow the problem to permeate to the point of where it became an issue. And and the thing is, is uh, what you've got is their algorithm is designed ultimately to like kind of push conspiratorial videos and to push these things around. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen a lot of fake news kind of shoot its way to the top of the algorithm. And so as a result of that, they've been bringing in, uh, they want to hire up to 10,000 employees to manually review content. I don't think and that's that going to be enough, honestly. <laughs> uh, with fo- with 400 hours of content uploaded every single minute, it's going to be very <laughs> difficult. And the thing is, though, is the way that their algorithm works now is that it like targets certain videos. It doesn't target other videos. It, it's just real hodgepodge situation. But more or less what it is is, is like – sorry, back to Polygon. Polygon uh, attacked conservative YouTubers complaining about YouTube and then moving over to a platform called DTube. Which is a decentralized tube, which is basically a, a, a YouTube, a video sharing platform that is all based around blockchain and cryptocurrency, and it's very interesting stuff. And then there's other people that have moved on to other places, but they're, you know, they're kind of criticizing them for like, you know, leaving YouTube. It's like, well, you're just trying to uh, once again go after these people that are your a basic to an extent audience, trying to show your relevance still. And I think this is where we find ourselves um, is that there's there's a place to the table, I think, for everybody. But uh, when it comes to video-based content and people watching video-based content, I think you know as well as I do that there's a lot more of that going around right now than people reading articles. Yeah. And and so the reason why the adpocalypse started last year and the reason why everything happened was, uh, in my opinion, had a lot to do with when the British government – and most people don't know this, but the British government actually pulled their ads from Google – when it uh, when they found as out the, as a website, the platform you mean Google, not not just YouTube, pulled, not just YouTube, but Google, and that's a big part of the apocalypse too. Is it was it wasn't just YouTube, it was also Google as a whole, uh, in many cases. But they discovered that a lot of their uh, ads were running alongside extremist content, and you know, like nationalistic content, ISIS content, things like that. And so they pulled their ads uh, from uh, from Google. Then the Wall Street Journal wanted to take it a step further and they wanted to go after PewDiePie. So they went after PewDiePie and they put together this like two minute long uh, hit piece on him that was basically taking jokes he had made, uh, you know, about Nazism and whatnot over the course of like six months. And he did like nine jokes and they put it in this like super cut that essentially like made it out to be like, oh, YouTube's top player is an anti-Semite or something. But the way, and I'm sure you understand this too, and I'm sure your audience does, the internet operates at a different speed than than the rest of the world. Yeah, they're like on ADD all, all the time, practically. There's something new happening yeah. like every couple minutes. And and humor, like memes pop out of every freaking corner, right? And and if people don't realize that, like how memes work, like on the internet, making a joke about Hitler is not the same as making it in the real world. And and now I understand that it's you know, still you, bad. Like let's not get it's it still twisted. Bad. It's still really yeah, bad. It's still bad. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't. Th- I think we could both agree, and a lot of our, our yeah. listeners could agree. Is like, yo, that it's not cool to make jokes yeah. about Hitler straight up. It's not good. I'm saying, but there's like a different connotation there. Yeah. You know. So it's kind of like when you're referencing memes. Like for example, I like to bring up the one. Um, have you ever, have you heard of the meme Hitler did nothing wrong? Yeah, I heard. I've heard about that. I've heard about right, it. Right, but you about know its too. origin. No, I do not. But know the it's origin of it. So it was a it was a uh, it was a four chan gag where Mountain Dew was running a contest to rename Mountain Dew and they wanted user submissions online and the top voted one would get would become the winner. So someone went on there and wrote Hitler did nothing wrong. Then 4chan got a hold of that and they upvoted it to number 1. 
Wow. And so, of course, of course, Mountain Dew was like, no, 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 we can't, we can't make this thing. This, this can't be a thing. We can't do this. And they, and they, they ended it. But the joke had already been set. And then people took it the next step and they printed out fake Mountain Dew labels that said Hitler did nothing wrong. Then they went to the grocery store and they taped them around Mountain Dew bottles. That's crazy. Right? That's absolutely it's crazy. It's crazy. But it's also like that's the Internet humor. And and it, it has a certain place. And that's what PewDiePie was, was effectively doing. And, and it just they used it against him. And then after that. The, the big kicker because that wounded that wounded some stuff because YouTube had to scramble to react. I know right? a lot of people were pretty upset. I know I remember reading all the editorials and the op eds and all the other pieces coming out at the time and the videos on YouTube that were criticizing PewDiePie and and, and full disclosure for everybody listening. Now yeah. I've had my opinions about the whole thing about PewDiePie. I didn't like it. I didn't think it was any good. I didn't think I think you can make jokes and, and points and, and lessons sure. with a far better approach to it. But again, teach their own. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree. I think like the Fiverr thing was like the death of all to me that was the really worst stupid. to me i thought that was really stupid. that was so stupid yeah it was i mean like at the same time i i, I very much have gallows humor i laugh at the stupidest stuff uh it doesn't mean i support it it's just like oh no right it, it's it's, yeah. it's it's bad stuff but yeah that was dumb and but then he followed it up with with subscribed keemstar was just <laughs> like it, again you have to understand like keemstar is well known in youtube as being this like is this is this person that no one really likes you know but he's fine with that and so there's a lot of it's a lot of in humor it's a lot of in jokes and it doesn't translate well and that's a big problem and so the follow up to that what really kicked the whole thing off because there's a series of events here um that 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 took it all out was uh, then the Wall Street Journal decided to get a little bit more ballsy and they wanted to find the worst video they could find that would be running premium ads and they found this video uh, titled Chief Keef Dances to Alabama N-Word. And the N-Word had a hard R ending. Mm -hmm. And on that, they claim that they ended up seeing a McDonald's ad, a Toyota ad, and a Starbucks ad, like the premium pre-roll ads. Yeah, well, like, was that, that confirmed? Running. Like, were they were actually still there when people looked at Well, I it? never saw... I, I don't know. I don't know. Because the thing is, having the N-Word hard R in the title is not going to allow your video to make any money. Yeah, um, like that automatically like flag it by YouTube from my yeah. understanding with the bots. Like, again, I don't remember how it was back then, but I know now like anything like that sort would automatically get flagged and get demonetized or even just get uh, a strike on it from my. Yeah, you, you can't even you can't even say like uh, you can't even use the word ISIS in a video without getting flagged like yeah. they are. I mean, they are hardcore about that, too. So that's that's a big part of it is uh, we looked into this. Well, you you had uh, like H3 H3 Productions who are a pretty big. Uh, YouTuber, they got Ethan, and Ethan Hila, yeah, yeah Ethan, Ethan Hila, yeah. Sorry, I, I just, just assume people know who they are. <laughs> um, they they looked into it. They they talked to the guy who runs the channel, and that guy confirmed that the that the video only made a little about a little bit of money because it had a couple hundred thousand views on it. And then he said that it was claimed by a multi channel network. It was claimed content ID wise. So then they went and talked to the guy who runs the content the the multi channel network, and he confirmed how much money. The video had made so in total because i looked this up in total between the six months that video had been up and by the time the wall street journal got to it guess how much money it made for on 200 plus thousand views did it did it make a lot twenty dollars and forty cents oh, out of or all 20, that twenty dollars and forty four cents that's what it was but does that still hold up with the wall street journal's claim that it was still making money from the ads that the thing is the thing is like you know they claim that like there's some people that have claimed that it's that it's been faked wall street journal stands by it um and personally, I think there's something shady that went on because I'm like, there's no way. Unless this is like a one in a million, like a one in a million, you just happen to get it. I, I, I just don't see that being being. Let me ask real. you this then, because because this brings up an interesting point that I think is a good spinoff from that is that, you know, with the percent, the outside perception that, that the, the, the the bigger public, you know, the people outside of YouTube that aren't constantly in the realm or in the environment or the ecosystem of YouTube, a perception is everything. You know, when they see things, sometimes people make judgments at first glance. Do you think that a lot of these sequence of events, including some of the stuff that's happened recently with like Logan Paul, Jake Paul, et cetera, ha has really kind of like hurt that and made things out to be a lot more worse because I could go to somebody randomly that I know that doesn't know much about anything of YouTube culture and they'll have, you know, some sort of opinion because of seeing something on the news or seeing something, you know, printed in magazines that has been written about. But it's like I've always had this uh, this opinion where I feel like there's this ammo that's kind of given to the media, even though people get upset about when they write about it, they give opinions about it. But the ammo and the stuff is there for them to write about it. It's like, OK, well, then why even glorify some of these people that are doing these messed up things? 
It's, you know, it's a weird thing. I think a lot of it boils down to just getting clicks. Like you put Logan Paul in a video, you put Logan Paul in a thumbnail, yeah. you tag it the right way. It's going to reach, it's going to reach certain people. Uh, it's, it's going to reach a lot of certain things. And, and that's part of the, uh, part of the problem, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, this Logan Paul situation, I, I'm of the odd belief that it actually, uh, benefited all of us. And the reason why I say that is because YouTube was running into a huge problem last year where when PewDiePie did his stuff and, and then the, the chief Keefe video thing happened, everyone was punished, right? Everyone everybody was got, punished. Everybody felt the, the, the repercussions yeah. from that. We, we all got punished for somebody else's mistake. And, you know, that's the whole issue is so we got we got punished for that. And then now Logan Paul, because he's like their top, he is their top person right now. You know, PewDiePie might have like 60 million subscribers, but Logan but he's, Paul he's in the trending right now. I remember his apology video when, when all that stuff happened with the suicide force it ended up being that it ended up going to the number one on trending that people were really upset about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I still stand by the fact that that video is fake. Um I, I, I wholeheart, wholeheartedly yeah, I don't think believe any, that I think, I think a lot of people, myself included, think that that was a half-hearted apology. That was completely nonsense. Oh, no. I'm talking the video itself. I'm talking the Suicide Force video was fake. Oh, you think so? Like, I don't oh, know. It, it seemed like it seemed like a lot of some of the stuff from what people were saying was like pretty real. But but again, I, that's neither here nor there, though. Like, just the perception of that, just on first glance. The, the perce- yeah, the perception of it was definitely was definitely not good. Um, cause I watched it and I'm like, Oh no, but uh, people were saying, Oh, his career is over. And I'm like, you don't understand how entertainment works. If you think that he this got is a good morning America right afterwards, which is crazy. He, he got on there to apologize and then immediately followed it up by tasing a rat. Yeah. You know? So it's like, he's 22. He's an idiot. Like, I, I'm not saying cut the guy any slack, but I'm saying like, there's going to be, you're, you you got to look at this from this perspective because you're going to see there's a lot of issues there. But ultimately uh, Logan Paul benefited everybody because uh, they were forced to then target, uh, to then respond to people on a case by case basis. Now, do you think that's also more indicative or really a cause of the problem because of the audience or more so the content creators? Because look at it this way: that Suicide Force Force video that Logan Paul did, and even I'll, I'll argue the 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 one where he tastes the rat afterwards, got millions of views. That's a lot of people watching this and they're like supporting, quote unquote, supporting him on stuff like that. And that's the stuff that people get even more upset about because they see all these people kind of getting behind it or kind of looking at it. Do you think it's really their fault, the audience's fault because of that? Or is it really the person that's creating that content? Um, I, it boils down to the content creator, obviously, because we're the per- we are the people that put it out there. Um, the thing is, though, is Logan Paul comes from – and I don't like to use the term privileged very often. I find it to be a very overused buzzword at this point. Yeah. But someone like him is protected. Absolutely. I mean, like if, if that Suicide Force video would have been anyone else, they would have been off the platform. They would have been deleted pretty much. They would have been gone. You know, yeah. If they were anywhere near, you know, if it was someone like me, I would have been, I would have had my channel terminated. Um, it just, I believe that, right. I wouldn't have been given the same special, the same special treatment. The reason why Logan Paul got the way that he did or got the treatment that he did was because there are, uh, certain, uh, what's the word I want to use here? Um, they have certain investments into him, you know, like, yeah, they might've pulled him off of the show he was on for YouTube red and they might've, they might've held off on the release of, of, you know, his new movie, the thinning Two, uh, all of these things. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're open to working with him again. Whereas PewDiePie, they canceled scare, scare PewDiePie. Uh, they booted him out of the preferred network. Uh, Disney walked away uh, had him booted out of maker he had his company Revel Mode that he had created, his MCN, with his favorite creators. That was dissolved immediately. I mean, I'm talking in the span of one day, everything PewDiePie had built for the most part came crumbling down. And and here it is a year later, and he's still making mistakes. He's still, but he's still, you know, he's still doing well for himself. But Logan Paul, uh, you know, has multiple scandal one after the other, and YouTube's like, well. Well, do you think you like know. a lot of the stuff that they did was more for perception for people to look like that they were doing something like, do you really think yeah. like a lot of that stuff was really impactful on him, you know, as a, as a creator and, and his channel as a platform? Uh, I don't think it's going to be that impactful on him. I don't think he cares. You really I mean, don't I think, think so? I don't think he cares because the thing is like the dude had just bought like a $6 million house, you know, mm-hmm. like he just bought a $6 million house. That was like news reports that came out uh, like before the end of the year. So that, you know, like the dude, as long as he has money. Like coming in and YouTube, you know, he still has, he, he gained subscribers. Like he went up like over, I think a couple million subscribers, people who didn't know who Logan Paul was Not now know who Logan Paul was. And, and the thing is like, they're watching his vlogs, you know, they're watching his content 
And and there are people out there that criticize him for when he said, like, I create like a 15 minute TV show every single day. Uh, and they're like, you just make a blog. It's like, well, no, it's like we're making reality television. Pretty much. He has a crew. Like he ha- has a crew with him, you know, like he'll shoot the stuff and then he hands it to an editor and that editor will then go and punch it up in order to make it look good. I, I have friends who worked on like reality TV shows doing the editing in, in, in Hollywood, you know, so it's like they have to pick apart a story and that's what they do. Um, but people look at him, you know, and he's super popular. So he's going to be making lots of money. And even though he's off Google preferred, he'll be back on Google preferred before the end of the year. Yeah, I, I could There's, totally see that. Yeah, but whereas PewDiePie is not, you know, and that's why he doesn't care anymore. Like he's like, you know, he already made his millions and he's he's probably fine. But it's just it's one of those things where it's like the rules that, you know, they, they had to change the rules to deal with Pew, to deal with Logan Paul. But the way that they changed them, I think, benefited the rest of us. Hmm, interesting. That That's an interesting take that I haven't heard from before. But again, you're coming from more of that realm where you're immersed in YouTube, unlike a lot of other people that I've talked with about similar subjects to this. Which leads me to this, if you could allow me to shift gears. I'm curious sure. uh, to talk a little bit about, again, some of your commentary stuff, specifically on gaming. Because obviously, we love gaming here at The Coalition. I love gaming. Again, I consider myself a games journalist as part of the industry and stuff. And I, I try to get perspectives from all facets of gaming here and there, from people that are in the industry quote unquote or out of the industry quote unquote and in your case you know one of the things i wanted to ask you about was about how this relationship between games media and also content creators because i feel that's a big thing that's discussed a lot over the last few years you know with all the stuff that's happened in the news with all the hot yeah. takes that have happened on various websites big and small stuff everybody has an opinion about this but i never really got an opinion from someone that really wasn't part of a, a larger outlet like for for example on the show here i've had ben kuchera from polygon come on the show and we talked about this i had colin moriarty uh from kind of funny and also formerly of ign come on the show and talk about the same thing and they all had their varying opinions and stuff but i wanted to ask you specifically why is it that you feel like there's a big divide between games media or traditional media or whatever uh in gaming uh as opposed to content creators or people that are part of new media people that are creating videos people like yourself or people that make podcasts and stuff why why is there that big divide or that big separation of that animosity there uh i'm actually probably one of the best people to ask this question to uh for those of you who don't know and you may have ever heard of a little thing called gamergate mm-hmm. uh i was basically just left of center when that thing happened yeah, like at the at the at the you know the apex of that thing. That's where like I remember was. when everything was happening. Well, it was like um, right now we're going on like about two three years now. That since it's, it's uh, we're coming up we're coming up on like three and a half years. Three and a half, yeah, roughly. Yeah, something like that. It was early so, in the year when it went down. I remember. No, it was uh, it was August. It was oh, like the August, end okay. of August 20, okay, so 2014. Got my dates wrong. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's okay. I remember. Trust me, I'll never forget. Uh, you know, no. Uh, so essentially, what it was is, you know, games me. Okay, so here's the way I view it. Uh, what you have is you have a problem with games media and in, uh, in independent gaming and in the indie gaming scene. Uh, they're all located in San Francisco. And that is where there's a large problem here where what you have is you have press, uh, you know, uh, I, like even like Ben Kuchera. But I have so many opinions on that person. I won't get into that here. But OK, people like, let's say Patricia Hernandez from uh, from Kotaku. Okay. OK, she you know, I'm sure you know who Patricia Hernandez. Yes. She's been around for a long time. Yeah. So Patricia Hernandez uh is a person who at, and this is why Gamergate was important. She would write articles promoting a game, but not disclose the fact that she was living with the person making the game in one case and dating the person who made the game in another case. So she would sit there and act unethically. This is a violation of ethics. I, I you know, I, I don't care if you write about cars, games, guns, or you know what your neighbor with a poodle does down the street. There are always ethics that need to be maintained, because you know if you want to be a source of information, a source of knowledge, you want to be on the up and up. And this is the biggest problem. What we've discovered when it comes to games journalists inside, you know, uh, that particular sphere, especially, especially when it comes to San Francisco. And so the divide that there is right now, this animosity, a lot of it stems back to Leigh Alexander, uh, formerly, I forget who she worked for, but it doesn't matter. Uh, She basically kind of helped put this, uh, what we call the gamers are dead articles. And it happened um, at the end of August, 2014, where all of a sudden in one day, you had like 12 articles come out from a multitude of different platforms or different outlets all basically saying gamers are over gamers no longer have to be your audience gamers are dead like that's the gist 
And when you sit there and you are media for gaming, your job is to talk about games, to report on games, to talk about what's going on in the industry. And you put out an op-ed that says, oh, yeah, by the way, you're no longer our audience. We no longer need you. That's a gigantic slap in the face. Now, now it's funny you bring that up because Colin Moriarty brought the same thing up to me when I talked to him about this. And he was of the mindset, being someone that came from that same realm, though, I, I think it's it's also good to acknowledge that I think that sometimes there's a broad brush that's painted a lot of uh, uh, amongst a lot yeah, of different people. No, because, I, I will agree. And, and the reason why I bring that up because I wanted to ask you because I've experienced this myself. Where again, being someone that considers themselves as a games journalist, I was never really a part of something like that. But then I still get lumped up with that same grouping, whatever opinions people might have. Like I've even had it on social media where people would try to invalidate my opinion because I'm a games journalist, or would try to use that as like a derogatory thing. And I've seen that on the rise over the last few years, where Colin came up on, on where he where he was kind of like speaking on, it, and he's talked about this and a few other places as well where he felt like it's wrong for the people that were writing editorials or part of these outlets to really kind of openly attack the audience because you could give your opinion i think that everybody could have their opinion and kind of put it out there in whatever form and people could read it take what it is from it and then just agree or disagree but i he felt that it was wrong for people to come kind of you know openly kind of say like you know and insult the audience in a sense where it's like you guys are feeling this way no you're not supposed to feel this way you're not supposed to do this stuff i know better because i'm the one writing the stuff he felt that was wrong and i can understand that but i also don't understand why is it that all of a sudden because of those few instances that everybody that's associated with that gets lumped in together with that like can you explain well, that to me yeah i can so okay so basically it kind of and i agree with you that not every games journalist is in any way related to all this stuff it's generally a pocket of people uh and these people though the thing is is that they're to to a lot of people like myself uh they come across as like smug and arrogant and I mean, I come across as smug and arrogant too. I'm not going to lie, but it, it's for the most part uh, in this particular situation, you had like 12 articles all in one day. So this wasn't like this wasn't I like this. a. I remember this. You know, time. it was very much a coordinated effort. Um, and if you go and you look, like we we then then it came out the whole game journal pros list, right? Which I'm I ultimately I'm not super even against the the list. I understand people are going to talk, they're going to communicate. You know, people are friends. That's perfectly fine. But yeah. when 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 they leaked out when the 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 threads leaked out about how Zoe Quinn they wanted to buy her like flowers and they wanted to buy her all these things to you know to to say they're sorry for what's going on or to show support or whatever uh, it was kind of like look you you're you're all you know you, none of you are looking at, at at what information has been presented you're taking an ideological side and then you're you know you're kind of putting her in this situation like I mean we could go off on the whole Zoe Quinn thing forever. That, that's a whole nother four um, hour a whole conversation. other thing, <laughs> whole other thing. Uh, cause I'm in, her, cause yeah, I'm even in her book. So that's pretty funny too. Um, and, uh, but more or less what it is, is that, uh, all gamers want ultimately is to be just reported to fairly. Like, you know, if you are going to talk about someone who, you know, personally, just say, I know this person, that's really about it. Uh, that literally is simply it, but just the mere, uh, the mere request for that. Or in some cases, I would argue a very loud, audible demand for that was met with this pushback from these people that did feel like they were better than the audience that they were serving. And that is where these articles came from. These articles weren't written from the perspective of anyone that was trying to be objective in their or position. Or to inform or be the a, audience in general. Yeah, they're, they're sitting there trying to tell you that like, nee, 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 we don't care what you have to say. We don't care about you. And it's like, oh, oh, really? Okay. And then what you also had is you had uh, people up there, like they were saying it was mostly men who were acting this way, who, who believed this, like, like there were no women and no, no, no trans women or, or trans men or, or, you know, gay straight by whatever uh, people in Gamergate. And then, you know, you had the hashtag, not my shield where you had people, men, you know, gay men, women of color, whatever coming out. And they're like, no, 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 no. I play games. I also want this. Don't please don't speak for me. Right. And then they were immediately ignored. They were immediately scoffed at. So what you have is this elitist attitude that has come out of of that particular sector of games journalists and these people like. Like lay like Le Alexander and like Ben Kuchera that act this particular way that can have no criticism, you know, wielded at them without absolutely hiding behind their freaking uh their friends and their industry. And there's a reason why there's a huge divide. So that's also a reason why people like myself uh, have been able to find a foothold 
in this particular space and find a, a, a way to make a living, to have a career, you know, in, 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 in doing this kind of content. Yeah. Like I try to be, I look, I'm not always the most objective person on the planet. I'll, I'll definitely be the first to admit Every, that. Nobody's in five. And basically. Yeah, no, so I mean, like, but you know, you watch my content, and like, I I try to be as objective as I possibly can. Yeah. And the the problem with it with the with the guess you could say Gamergate and everything else was that like it brought out a lot of anger, a lot of animosity, and a lot of that animosity uh, leading into Gamergate. Gamergate wasn't kind of like a, a singular event; it was a multitude of events that are kind of just you know this tinderbox uh, situation. Yeah. And so- it goes back even to 2012. You know, as far like even before, like, you know, uh, you, you could argue um, I, I could probably tell you the first instance of this stuff I could think of um, would be, I want to say, February 2012 and the whole Jennifer Hepler incident. I, I think it gets a little Do you remember a, that? I don't remember any of that, but I think it gets a little little bit too meta and a little bit too deep down the it, rabbit it, hole. It, 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 <laughs> it, yeah, like this goes way back. I mean, to summarize, you had a, a Bioware uh, writer who basically had said in an interview that she wanted, you know, she would like the ability to skip combat and get to the story. Right. And, you know, at the time people didn't like, you know, people at the t- wouldn't even like that now because gamers, uh, not all, but there are a vocal few that would say stuff like, Oh, well that's just a movie or that's just a book or a TV show. Why don't you go and watch those things? And it's like, well, why not both? Like there are times I would be, I think it'd be cool if they had a game that had like a, you know, a movie function where it's like, oh yeah, you forgot the story of the game or something like that. Here you go. We're going to, we're going to give you all the cutscenes and some context in the game to get you, get you up to date. More games need to do that, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Like Gears of War three, uh, had the, uh, had the recap feature, which it recapped the story of Gears of War one and Gears of War two in order to prep you for Gears of War. There's nothing wrong with recapping or there's nothing wrong. I think with having, you know, like a game as a movie scenario, uh, if you can still have both. But at the time, you had that go out, and there was a criticism b- back upon that. And uh, there was other things that people had then twisted her to say that I don't think she actually said. And that kind of caused this big backlash. That was right before the release of Mass Effect 3. And that also did tie into Mass Effect 3 not selling very well, never mind the whole, you know. And Colin, Colin has... has you mentioned Colin, but Colin got a lot of flack because he was. I remember his the video when he time. when he did about a yeah. whole video about it at the time. Yeah, so it's again there was a lot of tumult, a lot of tumultuous stuff happening in 2012, and then of course after that, so you had Hepler, you had Mass Effect Three, and then I'm not even kidding you. Two months later, Anita Sarkeesian comes on the scene, and holy crap, uh, holy crap, that was a whole other can of worms. But they all tie in together. They all tie into the narrative that sparked Gamergate a couple years later. Which is simply the fact that what you have is you've got people in this industry that not everyone, but a select few, who will very much insulate and protect each other and 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 everything else. But the thing is they're also human, and that is I think something that does get um forgotten, if I'm being perfectly fair. Yeah. I feel like there are times I have been critical, like I will fully admit the first time I criticized Anita Sarkeesian, I said stupid things that I regret wholeheartedly. And, you know, I was not I, who I am now is not who I was then. It doesn't excuse what I had said. But, you know, I've I've tried my best to apologize. Everybody uh, grows and evolves in some way. Yeah. Right? And and so it's kind of like, you know, so there's that. And I think at the time, too, gaming, you know, was coming into this. Because if you, if you remember, like in, in 2003 or something, you know, gaming was like a like a three billion dollar a year, uh, you know, uh, they were making some bank. A lot of people were they're making, making they're they're making bank, but they were just starting to make the bank. Hollywood was still the number one contender for true. entertainment. Very, very true. Now, you know, uh, gaming is going to crank over a billion, a hundred billion in a year, right? Definitely. A decade later, it's it's up a hundred billion, and so there's a lot of money that goes into this, and a lot of people, and a lot of eyeballs, and a lot of a lot of uh, you know people trying to get their hands on it, and a lot of people also trying to strive for relevance so, and so want it. Let me ask you sorry. this then. Sorry to interrupt, but I think that's another good point that we should touch on and stuff. Do you ever think like this animosity would go away, or do you think like this whole divide would be mended somehow? Because again, you have people like me, you know, not to toot my own horn, but you also got other people that are similar to me that aren't like that, that are still part of that environment, that are still games journalists, that are still whatever journalists or whatever uh, media or influencers that are out there that don't have that same mentality, that don't have that that 
standoffish, you know, mindset when it comes to making content or even talking to the audience like that on both sides, both on the media side and also on the content creator or YouTube or streamer side like that. Do you think all of that's going to go away at some point or at least, you know, be much more uh, subdued compared to what it's been like the last couple of years? Oh, man, I would love to say that. I would love to see that happen. I would absolutely love to see that kind of discourse take place. Um, you know, I think I think things can, but they require um, communication uh, on both uh, sides, probably. Yeah, I, communication would be good, I think, also. And it would require like, you know, um, the problem with it is, is that we tend to lump, right? Yeah. Groups of people together. Uh, it just, cause it's easier to convey Cause you have to keep in mind too. So if you look at YouTube going, kind of going back 400 hours of content are uploaded every single minute. So you are, I mean, I am always fighting for eyeballs. You as a journalist, you are fighting for eyeballs, you know, uh, like you, everyone's fighting for attention. And, and when that happens, it becomes sometimes easier to tear down your ideological opponent, so to speak, than it is to like you know, try to let, have everyone be in a live and let live scenario. Yeah. And, and that is where I ultimately find ourselves right now. Uh, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. There's always going to be somebody that's going to be gunning for gunning for your seat. And it's unfortunate, but I don't think that that particular nature of humanity is ever going to change. Um, but I think if we maybe like, honestly, I will say this Twitter is horrible. Twitter needs to go away. Like, you know, <laughs> like, Twitter, Twitter is nothing good for the world, period, because you have a limited space and no way to really kind of emphasize your point. And as a result of that, you know, people say they fire off shots without thinking about it. And then there's a snarky comeback. And then that, that boils into, you know, to, to an online war that takes you like eight hours or all freaking day. And I know because I've been in a minute. <laughs> no, I'll sit down. To social media is crazy. Twitter. Social media. And I used to, I used to teach social media when I lived in Hollywood. I would teach it to actors and directors, and everything. Yeah. Um. And, and I would teach people like how to use it for the for the betterment. Man, that was like six years ago. Like that. Like you can still do it, but damn, it is like it's harder. It's harder than hell now. It's tough to out here. Remotely in these get out there. <laughs> it's yeah, because it's like you're always. Because you're always fighting somebody for something or another. And as I said at the beginning of this thing, when it comes to being a YouTuber, we're always fighting for our right to exist uh, as new media, as as an influencer, so to speak. And so there are people out there that do work in the traditional world that do not like what we do. And then you've got people that are on our side that are maybe not as popular as they'd like to be. So then they put that anger on people who are. And, you know... Uh, so that becomes an issue too. And then you have people who do get to be too big and then they get a super huge ego. Uh, but then again, to be in this industry, I, I think you have to have an ego, uh, at some point because you're, you know, you're getting bombarded with comments. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've got 160,000 subscribers. I get thousands of comments a day. That's a lot of people. It's uh, <laughs> a lot, a lot of people. And so it's like, I, I'm like, look, if you want to talk to me, like, fine, like, here's where I'll be. If you want to talk to me sort of thing. Um, it just becomes, it, it's a constant juggle that can do a lot to degrade on someone's mental state. And, and once that happens, like it, it just, it's kind of like they grind it down, grind it down. And then people, you know, kind of pop. I mean, kind of look at the whole thing with, with, with Colin Moriarty and, and kind of funny, Yeah. you know, he made a, he made a one-off joke. Uh, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a dumb joke, but it was a one-off joke. And because of the climate that that we live in because of the climate that people uh you know in in the industry in the games industry uh have kind of permeated uh you know there was all of a sudden Collins not going to PAX East and then I I pre I correctly predicted that he would be out of the company by the next week and then I said you know then I was right and then I said he'll be out of the house he'll move out of the I remember out of being Greg's at house. PAX when that happened I was pretty pissed off at that because I was because I've seen I've met Colin a couple times in person yeah. you know, at E3 and at Comic Con stuff I was looking forward to seeing him back then at that particular PAX I remember when all that happened I was pretty upset yeah I mean I don't like I don't I didn't really know Colin at the time I was still kind of mad at him for the whole Mass Effect thing and and so and because Colin has an ego right like we all do, yeah. but in this in the time since then, like uh, Colin and I, we talk occasionally. We follow each other on Twitter. Uh, I like what I, you know. I think like now that I've maybe looked at it from a different perspective, I can see the things 
like I can see, okay, we maybe have a lot more in common than I originally thought. That's a funny point so, that you bring up that I, that I want to touch on that, that I think we should sure. also mention. Do you think also a lot of this could also be kind of alleviated or remedied through collaboration? Because I've, I'm always of the mindset where I think collaboration is a very good thing amongst creators, even big or small like that, because it could create dope stuff for everybody. And I feel like in gaming and games media or just the industry as a whole, a lot of people from both sides need to start collaborating a lot more, not just with bigger websites, but even with smaller creators, smaller websites and kind of get a lot more of that kind of cahoots and a lot more of that communication going between people like for my, my, my myself again as an example having you on the show having other creators on the show having other uh games media people games journalists games influencers on the show like that there's a form of collaboration there because there's a conversation happening there's people exactly. working together to put out that food for thought and 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 thoughts and and kind of perspective out there for people that i feel like we don't get enough of and i want to personally for me i want to see more of that but do you think like that's a, a one good kind of step forward uh, yeah, no, I absolutely do. I absolutely do. And uh, like, unfortunately, right now we have this event happening in, on the YouTube side of things called Internet Blood Sports. And it's it's nothing but a dog pile. It's, so it doesn't really allow for any kind of uh, any kind of actual discourse to take place. Model. It's simply just it, it, yeah, it's just trying to bring people in in terms to fight. Uh, and, and that's about it. And it's just playing on people's raw emotions uh, over the course of the past year that a few people have been able to profit off of greatly. And uh, I personally refuse to engage in it uh, in terms of, you know, going on to the program uh, and everything else. But yeah, we're seeing a lot of this kind of stuff. Whereas uh, like th there, there are people out there that like I criticized a couple years ago that uh, I have since ended up having a dialogue with and, you know, become uh, amenable with yeah. them. You know, there are people out there that I thought I would never, ever, ever get along with and we're friends on we're, you know we're, we're friends on facebook and i keep my personal facebook very private so it's kind of like you know there's there are people out there that you can you can talk to that you can you know change your perspective on it, it's just you, you can't do it through social media true that's the biggest problem and a lot of people when they do this like when you when you are a personality so to speak uh you generally tend to put on that mask right like you have to kind of go to that place so there are people out there that are like always raging up a storm on on youtube or whatever and then you talk to them and they're like the most just like laid back person and you're like what the hell or sometimes the inverse of that i've had it where i've met creators like very big creators is that i've been fans of that the complete opposite of that where they'll be really chill really cool and they'll have their game face on but then when you talk to them in person it's the complete opposite it's like very close yeah. off. All right. And also the other thing I think we should acknowledge too is that there's also those people out there that don't want the collaboration, that don't want the dialogue. Where I've even tried a couple of times, even inviting people on the show or even just trying to reach out and kind of try to do something together with people that are just so out of that and just don't want to do so. Because Whether it's selfishness or just trying to preserve one's own, I guess, you know, kind of workflow or whatever that just don't want that, which I think is destructive. I think it's bad. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Like, I tend to keep a lot to myself as it is. Like, this week, surprisingly, I'm on, like, I've been invited on to, like, a multitude of podcasts this week. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. Because, like, for the most part, I just keep to myself and do my own thing. Um, And so I, I get that. And so, but it is good to step out. Like, it is good to uh, to have a conversation with people, to talk with them um, in a way that's that's, you know, not going to have, like, any kind of preconceived dispositions on what you're going to be doing. Definitely. Right. And, and I think that's, that's probably going to be for the best. What I'd like to see is, you know, like I'd like to see people um, like Ben Kuchera not hide behind a block list on Twitter, you know, and I'd like to see him maybe be open to being, you know, uh, criticized over some of the stuff that he says. And maybe, I don't know, listen to people when they say like, you're making broad assumptions. Uh, and, you know, and everything else. Uh, but then also at the same time, the same could be said for people like myself, where I need to be more open to listening to where I may have done wrong. I think everybody uh, on all become, sides, everybody on all sides yeah, almost. And sometimes it's hard to do. It is. Sometimes it's hard to do because what people get mad at you over is very much just like, sometimes it feels like the most like stupid thing on the planet to get mad over. But then again, we're not all seeing everything from the same perspective. Very we're true. not all seeing everything from the same, uh, from the same, you know, lens. And especially when it comes to dealing with social issues or or um, you could call it like identity politics or culture politics or things like that. Real life issues because now we're outside of gaming. Yeah, outside of gaming. But a lot of what it is, too, is if you look at like a lot of the way that the games industry, games journalism side, not all but some have gone to is everything is about, um, you know, like, like it's it's all kind of. 
uh, I don't want to like, I'm trying to think the best way to describe it because it's a lot of it's identity politics that comes out. Like the need for diversity, the need for certain things to be kind of addressed or things that need to be talked about or things that need to be handled that we care and stuff like that. Yeah, pretty much. It's and that that rubs people the wrong way because they're like, look, if, here, here's and here's the God's honest truth. If you want diversity and inclusion in gaming, just do it, right? Like, don't don't make a big deal about it because it, that's how you normalize it, right? When you when you come out and you you know and you you got these journalists that beat their chests uh, to the progressive stack and they're like, you know, oh, this we have this character, we have to have this in there, and it's just it puts this this pressure on on either the person reading it to agree to fall into that echo chamber or it puts pressure on the company to like try to do it it puts pressure on people unneeded pressure but the best way to 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 handle the culture war is to just do it right it's like some things i I would say some things if they were denied like you know the subject of gay marriage like you know they had to fight for gay marriage to be recognized by the the supreme court as being a thing and that's good I'm, i'm more than happy for them um, but then, you know, but putting, having, a, a you know, a black gay trans lead in a video game, um, if you're going to do it, just do it right. Don't, don't wait for approval from, from, the, from the audience. But that, because the thing is too, is what you get is you get this negative backlash, right? Like look at, uh, look at Ghostbusters 2016, for example, Yeah. Ghost, Ghostbusters reboots coming out for one, like no one was super excited for it. And then they said, oh, it's going to be all women. And like a couple people were like that's a really dumb idea because you know so a couple couple people were misogynistic so then the narrative becomes in the movie side of of the of the press uh oh misogynists hate the new ghostbusters and it's like well no if you've gone you, you know you know the midnight sedge guys if yeah. you go and watch some of their Go- ghostbusters videos they found out like the plot line like the sony email hacks uh saw paul feig's pitch for Ghostbusters, and it was the movie. Like what he pitched to Amy Pascal in like 2014 is what we saw in 2016, and and it was bad. It was bad beyond belief. And the thing was that was out there, and people were criticizing that, and they're like, no, 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 you you just hate the women. And it's like, no, 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 this thing looks really stupid. It became an argument for argument's sake, when, almost. Exactly, and then it was like, then there was the the argument back of, oh, the trailer is the most disliked trailer in YouTube history history and then the reports and then all the all the headlines i still don't oh, believe that I, I, I didn't believe that back then i still don't believe that now i think there's far more worse i don't stuff that's it, been no. disliked uh, on youtube yeah well it was at the time at the time it had that like two hundred thousand dislikes or something and and the thing is anyone who knows anything about youtube analytics dislikes me nothing actually dis, dislikes only benefit your channel by the way yeah because uh it just shows engagement so people who dislike a video, it's just there for sure. The it's, haters it's are helping them out, basically. The haters are really helping them out. Oh, yeah, very much so. But they, they think it's hurting. Like, it's yeah, there's a whole, whole other argument to me about that one. But then, when, uh, so when, when you had the narrative on Ghostbusters set that people who disliked the trailer were misogynists, then you had the director get in on it. You had the actors, Melissa McCarthy and uh, I think uh, Kristen Wiig kind of jumped down on that one. Then you had the studio head come out and say uh, same kind of things. And so they were creating this narrative where if you don't like the movie, you're a sexist. And you know, and I criticized the hell out of Ghostbusters because every time they did something like this, I'm like, you don't realize what you're doing. You are alienating an audience. You are alienating people that could otherwise go and see this movie. And so I went, because I, I, I saw the movie opening night, the preview show, because I figured, screw it, I've already ragged on this movie enough for like four months. I'm going to go watch it. Yeah. And I go there with my girlfriend. She loves Melissa McCarthy. She loves Kristen Wiig. She wanted to see the movie. We, we get there. There were like 30 people in like the screening, the 7 p.m. pre you know preview night screening and stuff is are usually sold out. 30 people. We watch the movie. It's god awful. She, we were on our way walking out and she just goes, can we get our money back for that? And, and I'm like, right then and there. And then I heard a theater employee overhear us and he groaned loudly and I'm like, ah, I get you. But that was the whole point was the movie. Th- this was the narrative then. Like the movie wasn't very good, but it had an opportunity to survive provided that they didn't start attacking the audience. Yeah. And, and then ultimately the audience was like, well, I don't want to go see a movie about go- about busting ghosts. That's this politicized. Not everything has to be political. Not everything has to be part of that shit. And that's a big problem that we find right now, especially when it comes to talking about 
oh hell entertainment man like star wars for example it's really uh, where uh, even in that case and I, you could even argue to star wars to an extent where a lot of those conversations a lot of that that clashing is at the expense of a legacy franchise because obviously ghostbusters big franchise big big deal to a lot of people and you can say the same thing about star wars now where that type of stuff it turns a lot of people off it really does it, it really does and uh you know it's not so much like star wars like it's not the studio, you know, didn't do anything with Star Wars in regards to like that. Sony did for uh, for Ghostbusters, but you know, Star Wars comes out. I don't know, you know, I didn't really care for it, um, and then I complained about it because I was pretty. I, I came home and I was I was worked up. I was I was not happy about what I saw, <laughs> and because uh, I because because you know I'm a, I'm a screenwriter. I'm a writer. Like from a narrative standpoint, I was just so angry at how they did things from a narrative standpoint, and uh, you know, then like you get online and it's all this defense of star wars you have all like the the defense of the movie uh and you know articles coming out saying oh if you if you don't like it you're you know if you criticize ray uh you're sexist which that was the thing from force awakens too because there was a big push about ray being a little bit too um what's the word uh too, uh, powerful? too perfect too perfect <laughs> Too, too perfect, perfect right mm-hmm. and then, i mean like that you know the mary sue argument comes out quite a bit so when you start politicizing everything and and everything else, it just becomes this 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 bigger issue, this bigger issue. Um, now, granted, granted, politic- politicization on this kind of media outlet, I'm not going to lie, it does have an impact, right? Yeah. People like negativity; they like drama. Like you know, I, I did a video last night about some potential problems, possibly with Deadpool too, and talking about what I saw online and kind of putting other things together. And I titled it "Is Deadpool Two in Trouble." Now, the thing is, is this is where I, I find the biggest problem, and I'm sure you might have find this yourself. How do you title something? Without it being looked like cl- clickbait, basically, which clickbait, clickbait is yeah, not how, a bad thing. How, clickbait's not exactly a bad thing, but it's like, how can it be engaging but not give everything away? And and so it's kind of like, it's like that. And so that's that's a constant fight because then you're always trying to like figure out the best way. But uh, when you but when you look at other article headlines that that sit there and they have like an attack in the headline. Uh, for the sake of being that level of clickbait, then we're, you know, it, it just becomes this huge argument across the board. It's, it, it's, it's all, it's all messed up is what I'm trying to say. It's all, yeah. it's all, all crazy. Yeah, I got you. And I, I think that there's a good uh, argument and a good discussion that could happen amongst all that stuff. Cause I look at it in the same way with gaming and, and entertainment, I kind of see the parallels between that and also the music industry. And I see a lot of kind of like, you know, similar things where it's kind of like handled in the same way. And it's almost the exact same type of conversations that go all over the place. But to kind of wind things down a little bit, since we're kind of coming up to the wrap up on this show, I want to ask you the same question that I ask everybody that comes up on TK spotlight, the same exact type of thing, you know, and I get a variety of different responses and stuff so what is it one thing that you feel like you could tell the audience that you know those that are listening to this now that they feel like they could walk away with this episode with something like some food for thought or anything of the sort that you feel like you could give to the audience right now i guess i i should uh ask like in what regard like in, just in what... anything and anything it could be something life related it could be something career related because again all the people that usually come up on the show they'll say one thing and sometimes they'll they'll give like a quote or something you know that that really kind of causes people to think or really make people feel like they walked away with this episode besides the conversation that they've learned something or that they could take something out of all of this okay um i would say like here's the thing is if you want to like if you are a person who finds yourself wanting to get into this particular game whether it is being a journalist whether it's being a pundit whether it's being a commentator whether it's youtube or it's a website just be true to yourself and and always keep 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 hustling essentially you have to yeah but anyone can do these jobs so if you are a person out there who does not like the status quo of either at anything whether it's youtube or journalism whatever you can be that change it's not an easy road, but anyone can do it. I started doing this thing in the worst possible way, in my opinion. I was unemployed. I was on food stamps and I was living in Los Angeles and I was angry at the world. I was just angry because I had made some dumb choices and I was in a place that wasn't good. And I, and I was jealous of people that I knew who were doing YouTube full time, right? And could pay their rent. I couldn't even pay my rent. And, and everything else. And so I was just like at this place. So I thought, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to take my phone. I'm going to yell about things on the internet. I'm going to become the most, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be full of animosity. I'm going to make people hate me. And that's where I'm going to get money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that particular role. Not the right move, period. Hands down. Took me three years, 
to realize that and a couple lucky breaks to get to the point of being able to go full time in April of 2015. Here it is, March of 2018. I've got 160,000 subs. This is my full time job. I bought a house. I started a family. This is my career. Congrats. It takes time. Thank you. It takes time and anyone can do it. That's what I want to say is like anyone can. So if you've ever wanted to, there's no better time than right now. Okay. It just, you have to hit your nose with the grindstone. That That's real. I think that that's a, some good food for thought. I think congratulations on that. Again, starting family. Cause again, you hear a lot of stories of people that, that want to get into YouTube and not making it like that, or at least, you know, not getting to that point, not getting to the million or so subscribers, making bank like that, but at least you're doing something right now where you're happy with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, the apocalypse kicked my ass, but, uh, cause it happened right as I was closing escrow on my house. Oh God. <laughs> and my girlfriend's like, Oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. I'm like, Oh really? Right now? Thanks God. Well, <laughs> you know, crazy. but you have to just, you have to just keep going. I started three buck theater as a way to, uh, as a way to kind of distance my, to move over to something else I want to talk about. And, uh, and to be honest with you, that channel in a year, just under 20,000 subs, uh, is, is, uh, going to, going to probably overall make more than the main channel. Um, simply because it's, it's a far more targeted, uh, channel than anything else. And, and it's doing pretty well. That's awesome. Like I said, congrats. That's awesome. I think that's a lot of good, uh, food for thought for everybody to really get out of this, you know, throughout our entire conversation with that. But Matt, thank you for coming onto the show. It's a pleasure chatting up with you. It was great to at least, you know, finally chat with you and talk with you after watching so many of your videos, like over the years. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me on. It's really, really cool. So where can everybody find you right now? You're on Twitter. You're on other social media. Where can everybody kind of communicate with you? Uh, the best way is, is, is Twitter as much as I hate it. It's true. Uh, which is just, uh, at mundane Matt, or you can just Google mundane Matt. Literally. I'm like the only person who uses that dumb name. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then you're also Monday Matt on YouTube. You're also three Punk yeah. theater on YouTube as well. Do you yeah. have a Patreon? Do you have a, any other, uh, social media? I do. Yeah. Uh, patreon.com forward slash Monday Matt. Um, and, uh, that's, yeah. I mean, new videos literally every day. Just about so. like multiple videos, like every day from what I've seen. I do, do about three videos a day on the main channel. Yeah. Like, and that's like seven days a week. Yeah. So that's a lot of content. That's a straight up. It, it is. It really is a lot of content, but, uh, luckily I'm, I have a system in place now, so it's, it's not as bad as it seems. That's cool. Yeah. But anyway, guys, you know, for all those that are listening either on iTunes, the website or on YouTube, there'll be links down below in the description box. So you guys can go to directly to any of that stuff. Check out Matt's other content, check out his other channel as well and his Patreon and everything else. But again, thank you, Matt, for coming on TK Spotlight with me. With that being said, though, guys, uh, make sure you guys leave a comment down below. Make sure you leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel, the coalition channel for all our videos related to gaming, uh, a whole bunch of other podcast shows, all the different types of uh, reviews that we got on the channel we got a lot of content that we've been posting up in i've been trying to get more and more cool special guests here on tk spotlight leave me suggestions of who you guys want me to bring onto the show with that being said though we will talk to you guys again very soon peace out and stay epic everybody